All right, so lesson 63. We're talking about the products of square roots and repeating decimals. All right, so let's see. Um, my guess is that you guys have seen this before. What I don't know is if you remember that you've seen this before. And so when you have the square root of m times the square root of n, um, I had another marker. Didn't I just have an orange marker? Oh, no, I was using this guy. Never mind. Um, square root of m times the square root of n. Can we simplify that any further? If I had the square root of 2 times the square root of 3, could I simplify that any further? I could. Can I take the square root of these guys, though? I mean, though, I could take it, I could use my calculator to get a decimal square root, but I can't simplify it any further and leave the square root simple as well, right? But can I combine these? I can multiply them together. So this is the same as the square root of 2 times 3 or square root of 6. So because both of them are under square roots, then I can do that. All right? So that means when you have the square root of m times the square root of n, you can rewrite that as the square root of m n. All right? The two of them multiplied together. So that's the, that's the square root rule. And we can do the reverse of that. Right, if we were given the square root of m times n, then we could say, I can split that up and make it the square root of m times the square root of n. All right? Where that's beneficial is when you have something like this. Like if, I've had, if I have the square root of 18, right, and I realize the square root of 18 is the square root of 9 times 2, then I can write that as the square root of 9 times the square root of 2, and what's the square root of 9? What? Three, right? Square root of nine is three, so I would rewrite that as three squared of two. Okay? So this, the, the square product of square roots rule allows us to do that. So let's see if we can work a couple of problems like that. What if I have the square root of 50? I'm going to simplify that guy. Any idea? Um, remember, with the square root, in order to pull out a number from there, you have to you have to pull out that number squared. So we could all, it, it would only be true that it would be 25 if, if 50 is 25 squared. Is 50 25 squared? No. It's not. What is 50? 50 is 25 times 2, right? So based on the square root product rule, I could change it to that. I don't know why I wrote that up there. Uh, so let's, let's rewrite it here, 25 times 2. And so then I can split it up and say that's the same as the square root of 25 times the square root of 2. What's the square root of 25? 5, right? So this is 5 then 5 times the square root of 2. Who said 5? Was it you, Liam? Right. Does that make sense? You guys see that? Any questions about that? So th what this allows us to do, it, it allows us to split up our numbers into num other numbers that are perfect, perfect squares. And so then we can, we can easily take the square root of that, all right? So another example would be the square root of 200. Now is, is, there, a square, is there a number that's a perfect square that's a factor of 200? What do I mean by perfect square? I mean numbers like 4, 9, 16, 25. Why are those perfect squares? They're all the result of, a, of the, a number multiplied times itself, right? 2 times 2 is 4, 3 times 3 is 9, 4 times 4 is 16. So if I take the square root of 16, what do I get? I get 4, because 4 times 4 
is 16, right? If I take the square root of 25, I get 5 because 5 times 5 is 25. So is there a number that is a product, is part of the, uh, that can, that's a factor, sorry, is there a number that's a factor of 200 that is a perfect square? And, and again, this is one of those things, the only way you're going to get good at this is just by practice, so that you start getting familiar with certain numbers that are perfect squares. So if we kind of think through it, let's just go through, let's start with 2, and think of all the numbers that are perfect squares. 2 times 2 is 4, so 4 is a perfect square, there's 1. What would be the next perfect square after 4? No? Nine. Well, I'm going to write these down. So the, the first perfect square would be one, but we kind of ignore that because, you know, it's, uh, I mean, we do need to remember that the square root of one is one, and that's why, because one is a perfect square. So, so one times one is one, two times two is four, three times three is nine. What's next? Uh, 25. No? Oh, this is one times one, two times two, two, three times three, four times four. Is what? 16. 5 times 5? 6 times 6? 36. 7 times 7? 49. I thought I was done with my, I thought I was done with my times tables. No, you're never done with your times tables. 8 times 8? 64. Uh, 9 times 9? 81. And then 10 times 10? 100, and it's, it might as well go ahead and go, you know, we typically learn all the way through our 12 times table. So what's 11 times 11? Does anybody remember? 121, and then 12 times 12. 144, right? So let's see, I had Jonah helping me with that. I had Madeline helping me with that. Who else helped me with that? Anybody else? Help me out? Did, did Alexa say one? All right. All right, so this is our, all the way with the timetables that we, we typically learned when we were younger, right? All the way through the 12 times tables. They're all the perfect squares in those times tables. So when we think about these numbers here, could I break this 200 down into a couple of factors that has one of these perfect squares in it? Yes, which one? What, which of these perfect squares is contained within this number here? In other words, I could say this number times this number equals 200, and one of those numbers is a perfect square. 100. Does everybody see that? I could say that 100 times 2 is 200, right? So that means that I can split this up into the square root of 100 times the square root of 2. What is the square root of 100? It's 10. Because 10 times 10, right? 10 square root of 2. Make sense? Again, it's just practice that's going to get you good at this, right? It's just working enough of these problems so that you immediately recognize the perfect squares. I mean, if you remember that 144 is a perfect square and you see the square root of 288, you should immediately think, oh, 288 is 2 times 144. And so the square root of 144 is 12, so the square root of 288 must be 12 times the square root of 2. All right? And you can, right now, you can write it out in these pieces so that you follow all the pieces, but eventually you're just going to see this and you're going to immediately go, oh, this is 10 squared root of 2. Because I know there's a perfect square in there, right? All right. Um, let's do one that's a little bit harder, a little less obvious. The square root of 108. Now sometimes you look at it and you go, I don't see the perfect square. Right? If I divide 108 in half, 54. it's 54. Is 54 a perfect square? Yeah. So making this 2 times 54 is not going to help me. Right? Sometimes it's easier to just go ahead and break this thing down into all of its factors. So I go, I say 2 times 54, and I can split 54 and say that's 2 times 27, right? And then I can split 27 and say 27 is 3 times 9, and then I can split 9 and say that, that 9 is 3 times 3, right? And it's totally okay to do that. Remember, when you split it down into its factors, you just take all of these here, and you put those under your square root. So you say this is 
2 times 2 times 3 times 3 times 3. All right, you can always go back to doing it that way. If you don't recognize the perfect square that's in it. And, uh, and then, what do we pull out of this? Let me have it like this. We pull out everything that's, that's duplicated. Anything that's that thing times itself can come out, right? Because those are all perfect, perfect squares, right? Because remember, 2 times 2 is a perfect square. That's 4, right? 3 times 3 is a perfect square. That's 9. And then we've got this 3 left out here. And so when I take the square root of 4, right, I can write this like this. Based on our square root product rule that we were just looking at. Then the square root of 4 is 2. The square root of 9 is 3. And I'm left with the square root of 3. So I pulled out. I took the square root of both the 4 and the 9, and then I multiply those together and I get 6 square root of 3. Now because I got that answer, that tells me, oh, okay, the square, that means that the square root of 108 was actually the square root of 36 times 3. I didn't see that. But if I had recognized that, I could have just done this here and then said, um, this is the same as the square root of 36 times the square root of 3, and when I take the square root of 36, I get 6 square root of 3. Yes? But either answer is also Either one, it, they, they each lead us to the same answer. So you'll get the correct answer either way you do it, all right? Either way is right. This is just quicker. If you can recognize that there's a perfect square in there, go ahead and pull that perfect square out. Yep? How can you recognize without having to do all the same? For, for me, for this one here, I, I probably would have done this because it wasn't obvious to me, right? Because I know this is a chapter on recognizing the perfect squares, then I, I might would have, I, I, do, I do know that 108 is divisible by 3. How do I know that? What's the trick for determining that 108 is divisible by 3? When you have a big number like this, if you add all of the numbers together, 1 plus 0 plus 8, all right, 1 plus 0 plus 8. If I add that together and I get an answer that's divisible by 3, then the big number is divisible by 3. That's the trick with recognizing that. All right? So if I had, if I had a number like this, 1, 2, 3, 1, 1, 1, because I know that 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 is uh, 3, 6, 9 is 9, and I know 9 is divisible by 3, then I know this number is divisible by 3. So I don't know what it would be, but I know I could punch that, that in my calculator and it would be divisible by 3. So I might have, because I know this chapter is trying to help us guess perfect squares, I would have recognized that that was divisible by 3, and so I might have punched into my calculator what is 108 divided by 3, and I would have seen that it was 36, and then I would have known that it had a perfect square. Okay? But you can always break it down like this, and this is fine. All right, any questions for me? All right, um, so moving along, let's go. I'm going to leave our perfect squares up there because we're going to need those. We may need them again in our next uh, our future chapter, future lesson. It's like two lessons later. The last part, the last section here is about repeating decimals. Yes, yes. What do I mean by repeating decimals? And can anybody give me an example of a repeating decimal? Yep. Pi. So pi is not a repeating decimal. Um, it actually never repeats. That's one of the things unique about pi. That pi is what we call an irrational number um, because we can't we can't write it as a as a simple fraction, um, it never, it just keeps going on and on and on. So that would not be an example. Yep. I, I, was thinking I mean, one that never ends. yeah, it is one that never ends. And it's pi never repeats itself, right? If you looked up pi, um, let's see. Where's oh, there's somebody, somebody punch in. I had a student in one of my classes that had memorized pi up to like 20 decimal places, but somebody, uh, if you, if you punch in one times, if you use your pi symbol on your calculator, you do one times pi, what do you get? It's just the pi 
Oh, does it? Just give me. Okay, mine won't do that. Let me do this. One times. Where are you? Pi. 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 I know you're on here somewhere. There you are. All right, so this is what I get when I punch it in to this calculator. Three point one four one five nine two six. Whoops. Six five four. All right, so that's pi to nine decimal places. But if you went further, you would see that these numbers never repeat one another. It just kind of keeps changing. So you don't see a pattern at any point to where they repeat. But we do have numbers like this. 1.3333, right? You just have a three that repeats over and over and over again. And so for numbers like that, we can write them like this. We put a bar over the number that repeats, right? So, what, what they note in the book is that there are some numbers, some repeating decimals that we need to memorize what they are in fractional form. So this, we would write this as a repeating decimal like that. Does anybody know what fraction that is? It's one third, right? So if you punch in, if you punch in one divided by three in your calculator, you're gonna get 0.33333. And you need to just memorize that. You just need to know that that's the case. Um, another one that they want you to memorize is one ninth. One ninth is 0 0.11111 or 0.1 repeating. This really just goes on and on and on. Right? Um, two thirds is 0 0.6 with the six repeating. And then finally, one sixth is 0.16 with the six repeat. So the one doesn't repeat in this one, but six does. Right? This is equal to 0.16666 in the case on an old sixes. Right? So know, know these. Right? This, this, and. this. I want you to memorize those. Okay? So that if you see that repeating decimal, you know immediately. Like if you see 0.16 with the 6 repeating, you know immediately, oh, that's 1 sixth. Right? If you see 0.33333 or 0.3 with a little bar over it showing it's repeating, you know that that's 1 third. Okay? So memorize these four. Any questions about that? So this is like one of the easiest things you can do in math, right? Just memorize it. No math skills needed. Just remember that those are equal. Right? There are some things in math you just need to memorize. All right, um, let's move on to lesson 64 and let's talk about domain. Um, they, they have a note in here that says that the set of permissible replacement values for the variables in a particular equation or inequality is called the domain for that equation or inequality. So like if I gave you, if I said, if I said y equals x squared, and I said the domain is all real numbers, it means that x can be anything that is um, that is a real number. All right, you can use anything, any value for x that is a real number. So you'll see. Uh, domain, kind of shorthand way to represent domain is you'll see, um, you may see something like this. In this case here, they're telling us that the only possible values for x would be 0, 1, and 2. They gave us that as a domain. They may write reals as using the symbol like that. It represents real numbers. Or you might see a domain that is listed as the 
positive integers. What are integers again? Did I remember? Yep. Positive and negative, negative numbers. Yeah, whole numbers, right? No decimal. So from negative infinity to negative 5, negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 on the positive infinity. It would be all of the integers. So when they're saying the positive integers here, they mean 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? What we would call the counting numbers. All right, so now that we understand that, we can do some of these graphing problems with inequalities where they give us a domain and we can graph it. So for example, they say, I will, if we want you to graph x is greater than 2, where the domain equals all real numbers. All right? So this one's not really that weird. This is what we're used to doing. When, I, when I've asked you in the past to graph x is greater than 2, you've always assumed that we were talking about all real numbers. And so, how would you graph x is greater than 2 on a number line? Give it a shot? No, I think I'm wrong. <laughs> well, you can still try. It's just trying to get your name on the board. Uh, an open circle, open 2, okay. an arrow pointing to the right. That's right. You're dead on. That's totally it. Um, Makes sense? If it had been greater than or equal to, then we would have colored the circle in, right? But it was just greater than, so we would have done it like that, right? So you guys are already used to graphing stuff where the domain's all real numbers, all right? But now we're going to change the domain, and we'll see how our graph changes. What if we said graph um, x is less than negative 1, where the domain equals positive positive integers. So less than negative 1, so we'll do negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. What does this one look like? X is less than negative 1, but the domain is only positive integers. Negative 1 open circle to the left. That would be true if the domain was all real numbers. What are the positive integers again? 1, 2, One, two and it keeps going, 3, 4, 5, right? Are there any positive integers that are less than negative 1? There are not, right? So there's actually nothing that we can, there's no way to graph this. There's no, no graph for that, right? There's no value that matches that. So this one's kind of a trick one. Um, but if we changed it to this, what if we said x is, um, what if we said x is greater than or equal to 1 and the domain is positive integers? Now what would we, how would we graph this? Any ideas about that? Closed circle on one, but we can't just go to the right because our domain is only positive integers, which are just one, two, three, right? So I probably, if I were to do this one, I would extend this out a little bit further and just show that it's two, three, four, and then maybe do like a heavily colored arrow there saying we're going to keep going that way, but we can only fill in where the actual integers are. Does that make sense to you guys? All right, and finally, what if we had something like this, where it's x x is not this is a weird one. X is not greater than or equal to 3, where the domain is 
just integers. How do I graph that? So I'm going to do 84, 83, 82, 81, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. It's always weird when they put the not slash through there. So what's the, what's the easy way to think about graphing this? I would rewrite this instead of trying to graph it like that. Do you guys know how you would rewrite that? X is less than 3. X is less than 3. Very good. Right? Just think about it like this. If x it has to be, if it was if it was x is greater than two, if x has to be greater than two, do you guys see that that means x could not be less than or equal to two? Right? When you not something, you, you're including everything other than that, right? So to include everything that's not greater than or equal to three, then you say, what we're actually considering here is everything that is less than. Does that make sense? So that's much easier to think about, right, than this. So we're going to say everything x is less than 3. So remember, we're not going to start with 3. What are we going to start with? We're going to start with 2 because, again, we're dealing with integers, right? So that's our domain. So we're only going to just do the integers here. We're going to do all of these integers on our number line like this. And then we're going to fill in our arrow at the end to show that we keep going. Make sense? All right. The last thing they note in this chapter here is that um, with with inequalities, we just want to remember that the additive property works for inequalities just like it works for. Um, equations, right? So we, we say if we have x um, equals 5, then it's totally okay for us to add a 2 to this side of the equation as long as we do what? What do we have to do? If we change one side of the equation, what do we have to do to the other side of the equation? The same thing, right? So it's okay to add a 2 over here as long as I also add, add a 2 here, right? And so the way that we write that out is we say if, if A equals B, then it would be true that A plus C equals B plus C. Whoops. Right? The additive property of equality says that. We can always add a number to one side as long as we add a number to the other side. Well, that's true for inequalities as well. So if A is greater than B, for example, we could say A plus C is greater than B plus C, right? For inequalities, we can also add something to one side as long as we add that thing to the other side, and we, and we won't change the value. So if we made this a, we made this a less than sign, then we could also say that. That would be true for, for, the, for inequality as well, okay? Make sense? So the rule doesn't change. And so if they give us something like this, and they say, they say, I want you to graph x plus 2 is less than 0, and your domain is, we'll just do a domain of integers, all right? Right, so if they ask us to graph that, how do we how, how are we going to think about this? How do we simplify this so it's easier to graph? We think about it the exact same way we would think about it if it was an equation and we're solving for x. So if we had x plus 2 equals 0, how would we solve for x? Subtract the 2 from both sides, right? We're allowed to do that. 
And so if I subtract the 2 from both sides, then I get that x is equal to negative 2. Right? I'm going to do the same thing here. If I subtract 2 from both sides, then I get x is less than negative 2. Okay? Because this rule right here says we can do that. We can add or subtract something to one side as long as we do the same thing to the other side. All right? Whether it's an equation or an inequality. All right? So this, this is what I actually want to graph. But I want to make sure my domain is all integers. So how would I graph that? So write down on the board one time. Okay, somebody on the board one time. Where would I put my first circle? Negative two. Not negative two because it's less than. Oh. It's not less than or equal to. So just two. Huh? What did you say? Negative three. negative three, right? It's everything that's less than negative two, but is an integer. So negative three, negative four, and then all the integers, negative integers that are further to the left. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, I'm gonna let you guys do the problems in the book that let you practice that. I think you, I think that's, that'll be pretty straightforward. Okay. Really, nothing that we've. It's all the examples that we did a moment ago where we were graphing inequalities. It's just now you realize that you can rearrange this and simplify. Okay. All right. So let's do um, the addition of radical expressions. This is kind of kind of like the question that um, I think Jonah, you asked the question about adding like terms. Were you the one that asked us to do that problem earlier? Yeah. So this is a very similar idea. And so, remember we said that if, um, you know, if you have 4x squared minus 2x squared, you can do the math, you can simplify that further because those are like terms, because they have the same variable with the same exponent, right? And so I can say that's the same as 2x squared, because 4 minus 2 is 2, right? The same thing applies with uh, radicals when you're dealing, what do I mean by radical? That's one of the toughest things with math is just getting all these terms down, right? So I'm going to keep using these terms and asking you guys these questions so that hopefully eventually it'll stick and you'll go, oh, when he says radical, I'm thinking of, you might know? Those ones where we have like decimals with the continuous signs. No, nope, that's a repeating decimal. That's a, repeating, that's a good guess though. Anybody else want to take a stab at what a radical is? It's where you have a square root or a cube root, any of those root symbols, all right? So if I have something like this, so here I had 4x squared minus 2x squared. If I had 4 square root of 2 minus 2 square root of 3, I can't simplify that any further because the number that's under the square root is not the same, all right? But if I have this, 4 square root of 2 minus 2 square root of 2. Now, because the radical portion of this of these two terms are identical, I can do the math and subtract the coefficient, this big number in the front, and say 4 minus 2 is 2, so the answer for this is 2 square root of 2. Does that make sense to everybody? So those are like terms because they have the same radical with the same number underneath it. Okay? So that's how we consider like terms in radical expressions. And so if that's the case, then what would this be? 4 square root of 2 minus 5 square root of 2 plus 12 square root of 2. What would that be? Are you trying to say that? Mm -hmm. uh, yep. 2 minus... Our, 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 so we've got three terms in here, right? We've got this term, this term, and this term. Are they like terms? They are, because they all have square roots of two in them, right? So remember, when we once we determine they're like terms, then we're just doing the math with the with the coefficient on the front. Four minus five is negative one. Negative one plus twelve is positive 11, right? So this would be 11 square root 2. You guys got it? 
same exact idea as when we were dealing with like terms over there. It's just now you're, you're dealing with radical expressions. So, so it has to be the same um, type of radical. Like if, if it's got, if you can't have a square root, like if this was a cube root, then this would not be a like term and you'd only be able to combine these two. All right, so it has to be the same type of radical. In this case here, they're all square roots. And it has the same have, it has to have the same number under under the radical symbol. Okay. All right. Last thing in this chapter. That's the only example I'm going to do of that because I think that's pretty pretty straightforward. Um, the last example we're going to do in this one is is calculating weighted averages. And we've already done something that's very similar to this when we talked about overall averages. It's a, it's, it's kind of the same concept. But um, with weighted averages, let's say we've got test scores. Um, let's say, okay, let's say that, that we've got scores, grades 70, 60, 71, and 89, all right? And so let's just say, this is kind of often the way it is in a lot of my math and science classes. This is more like the quiz average, right? That's why it counts so little. So that's the quiz average, and maybe we'll make the 71. Um, let's say this is let's say this is my chemistry class, all right? So the quiz averages are 60. The project, I'm not not project, the labs, the lab average is 71, and then the test average is 89. And there's actually another category in chemistry, but just for simplicity's sake, we're going to have this, all right? And we're going to say in my class that these are weighted scores, all right? So, uh, so for this class, the the sixties have a weight, the, the quizzes have a weight of uh, two, and the seventy ones have a weight of three, and the eighty nines have a weight of five. Basically, this is counting twenty percent, this is counting thirty percent, this is counting fifty percent. All right. So the weights are two, three, and five. Now, how do I figure out the weighted average of these test scores or these or these scores in class? The way that we do that is we say the 60 has a weight of 2, so it's going to be 2 times 60. All right? 71 has a weight of 3, so it's going to be 3 times 71. And then the 89 has a weight of 5, so it's going to be 5 times 89. All right? And then, does this look like the overall average? You guys remember doing the overall? This is very similar. What did we divide by when, when we were using overall averages? What number would I divide by in this case? You guys remember? I divide by this number in the front. These numbers in the front here added together. All right, Alexa. Would you divide by ten then? I would divide by ten, right? So it's like it's it's like we have two sixties, three seventy ones, and five eighty nines, right? So those are all the scores that we have. And so if I have two sixties and three, if I have two sixties and three seventy ones, right, and then. 589s, that gives me 10 altogether. So 10 scores altogether. So I divide the whole thing by 10, and I don't really know what that would be. Um, let's see, 2 times 60 plus 3 times 71 plus 5 times 81. Oops. And that whole thing divided by 10 looks like a 77.8. I hope if you take my chemistry class, you'll do a little better than that. But at least you would have passed, right? All right, does that make sense? See how weighted averages work? It's, 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 it's like almost the same concept that we learned with overall. It's, it really is kind of the same idea. So if you, could, if you understood overall average, then this should be no problem. But they'll give us a set of scores, and then they'll give us the weights. Um, like they tell us in example 65.5 in the book, they give us the scores of 60, 70, 80, and 90, and then they say they're weighted as 1, 2, 4, and 6. And you just do the same thing that we just did. right? Uh, what I do want to look at is uh, 65.6, which is worded a little differently. Um, it is again the same idea, but they give it they give us the weights and percentages this time, which is normally more how we how we do weighting. And so it says in the graduate level course, Smith R was taken. Um, sorry. 
In the graduate level course that Smith R was taking, each of the three tests were weighted 20% and the final paper was weighted 40%. So we had three tests at 20% and the final paper, final paper counted 40%. And so on his three tests, he got this. He got a 60%, a 70%, and an 80% on the three tests. And man, 60% on his final paper. It's tough, it's a tough class. What was his overall score for the course? All right, so to do the math for this, when we, when we do, um, when we plug in percentages and use them in math problems, we don't, we don't write them as percentages. How do we typically write them? Huh? Fractions. As, what say, fractions? You could write them as fractions or decimals. write them as decimals, right? So what would 60% what would for example be as a decimal? How do we calculate that? It'd be 0 0.6. We take 60 and we divide it by 100, right? So if we did it as a fraction, that would be 6, that would reduce to uh, 60 over 100 would be 6 tenths, which, you, which would reduce to uh, 3 fifths, right? If we punch it in our calculator, we'll get 0.6 for that. So well, we're going to think about all of these values as decimals when we punch them in our calculator, all right? So we have, we have three tests that each count 20%. All right, so they're weighted 20%. So 20% is 0.2. Does everybody see that? So 0.2 times the first test, which is not 60%, but 0.6. We're going to write it as a decimal. Plus the next test, which was also counted 20%. So 0.2 times 0.7. All right. Plus the next test, which was 0.2 times 0.8. And then plus the final paper, which was 40%, so that's going to be a 0.4 times 0.6. All right? Now, what are we going to divide this guy by? So we got all these weird decimals in here. It gets kind of, uh, kind of funky, right? But it's easy as long as we remember whatever number on the bottom is going to always be these numbers here added together, right? Whatever the weights are added together. Yes? Would be 0.10? So it would just be, it would be actually 1.0. It would be 1, right? So if we, but I'm, I'm going to write it down like this so that we understand what the math would be to figure that out. But yeah, if we add all those together, it's just going to be 1, right? The whole thing's divided by 1. So if you, if you punch this in your calculator, you're going to get a value of 0.66. And so if, if, the, if we want to know what the, weight, what the um, weighted average is of this guy, of these guys, since, every, since our initial problem was all in percentages, then we'll calculate, we'll multiply this times 100 to get the final value. And so the final value would have been 66%. Bummer, he failed this class. This is one of those professors, you want to read the reviews online ahead of time, and, you know, follow, follow the recommendations of other students that go, don't take this class. <laughs> this guy's really hard, and he doesn't curve anything. All right, does that make sense to you guys? You guys cool with that? Excellent. Uh, one more thing that I want to go over, and we will be done for the day. And this is really just uh, this is just an expanded version of the first lesson that we looked at today. So this isn't really new material. It's just you got to recognize some bigger. Uh, that's why I left these on the board. You got to recognize some bigger perfect squares. But we're going to show you an easy trick for that. All right. And, and no, you guys are good with this. No more questions about this. Cool. All right. Okay, so for this one, um, well, actually, we're, com we're going to combine a couple of things first, all right? First, let's combine uh, what we learned in uh, one of the lessons today with what we learned in the first lesson today. In our first lesson, we learned how to simplify these further, right? 
So how can I simplify square root of 18? Is there a perfect square in that? There is, right? So we recognize, oh, square root of 18 is square root of 9 times 2, right? What about square root of 8? Is there a perfect square in there? Yes. Yep. What is it? Yeah, so 4 is a perfect square. 4 times 2 is 8, right? So when I pull out my perfect squares, I have 3 square root of 2 plus um, 2 square root of 2. Everybody follow me on that? But now, what we learned in, was it the last, the last lesson or the lesson before? Anyway, we learned that these are actually like terms and we can add these together, right? Because they both have square roots of 2. So what would the final answer be for this guy? What'd you say? Not 4. What are we adding? actually adding together? We're adding together the, the coefficients here. 5, right? 5 square root of 2. I don't know why I did that. <laughs> <laughs> but you get it, right? You were, so you were thinking the right thing, you just said the wrong thing. I do that all the time. Don't feel bad. It's actually, it's like, I tell my wife it's a sign of brilliance is what it is actually. It's just that my brain is so advanced, it just gets ahead of itself. <laughs> uh, all right, but yeah, that's it. 5 square root of 2. Does that make sense to everybody? So you, you see how we're combining a couple of things that we've learned in previous chapters and we're putting them all together now? We simplified the radicals and then we recognized where we had like terms and we added those together, okay? Super simple. Um, so let's do one that's a little more complicated. Uh, we have the square root of 27 minus three times the square root of 18 minus six times the square root of 45. So the first thing I'm looking at in this is I'm checking to see do I have any perfect squares under my radical that I can pull out, right? Square root of 27, can I change that to something else? Yes. What? 3 times 3? 3 times 3 times 3. 3 times 3 times 3 or 3 times 9 if I want to leave it as a perfect square, right? So I'm going to write this as, I'm going to put the 9 first because that's what we're going to pull out in front. Good. I'm going to rewrite 3 square root of 18 as 3 square root of 9 times 2. Since 9 is a perfect square. And then what about 45? What's my perfect square in 45? 5. 9 times 5. 9 times 5. 9 is a perfect square, so 9 times 5. Everybody with me so far? All right. So what's the nine square root of 9 times 3 turn into? I'm going to do the extra step in this one that I didn't do in the last one, right? Remember, that, that means that square root of 9 times square root of 3, it could be written like that, right? This means I have 3 times the square root of 9 times the square root of 2, and here I have 6 times the square root of 9 times the square root of 5, right? We can rewrite it like that. Now, what's the square root of 9? 3. So I can rewrite this as 3 square root of 3, right? What's the square root of 9? Again, it's 3. What do I do with that 3 in the front? It's one of those things that you got to start, it's got to start clicking with you. You recognize what that, what I'm supposed to do. No, I'm not thinking about that yet. I'm not thinking about subtraction. 3, square root of 9, square root of 2. How, how are these, how are these, three values here all related to one another. Are they added together? Are they subtracted together? Are they multiplied, divided? What are they? Multiplied. They're all multiplied together, right? So if I take the square root of 9, what is the square root of 9? 3. I have to realize that it's multiplied times this 3 that's in the front. All right? So that's really what I have. I have 3 times 3 times the square root of 2. Does everybody see that? So it's crucial that you recognize that all these values are multiplied together. So that's what that becomes. And then the same thing here, we have a 6 times the 3, so the square root of 9 is 3, times the square root of 5. All right? So now when we multiply, when we simplify that, we have 3 square root of 3 minus 9 square root of 2 minus 18 square root of 5. Okay? Do I have any like terms? Now that I've pulled everything I could out of the radical. I don't have any like terms, right? 
None of, none of the radicals are the same. They're all different. I have square root of 3, square root of 2, and square root of 5. So I can't combine. This is as far as I can simplify this part. Everybody see that? All right? One final thing I want you to be able to do, and that is I want you to be able to take the square root of large numbers that have multiple zeros in it. All right? Because these are pretty simple. And here's the, here's the basic rule, all right? When we're thinking about um, when we're thinking about perfect squares, it turns out that one followed by any num any even number of zeros will always be a perfect square. All right? We we have one right here in our list of perfect squares. Right? 10 times 10 is 100, right? So 100 is a perfect square. Well, what would be the next perfect square that's a 1 followed by zeros? Well, it would be 100 times 100, right? And 100 times 100 would be a 1 followed by four zeros, all right? So we would write that as 10,000. And then the next perfect square would be 1,000 times 1,000. And that would be a 1 followed by six zeros or one million, okay? And you just keep going on and on. So as long as there is a, an even number of zeros right here, notice this has two zeros, this has four zeros, this has six zeros, then it is a perfect square. And if you're not sure which perfect square it is, you have a calculator, right? If you look at this and go, oh, it's got six zeros after it, so punch in one million in my calculator, take the square root of that, and it's gonna tell me that, it, that the square root of one million is 1,000, okay? So when I see a problem like this, I go, that's a five followed by an even number of zeros, right? So does everybody see that this is the same as five times 10,000, right? And so that means I can rewrite this as the square root of 10,000, because I know 10,000 is a perfect square times the square root of 5. And when I punch that in my calculator and take the square root of 10,000, I'm going to get 100, because 100 times 100 is 10,000. So the answer for this is 100 square root of 5. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? All right, what about if, what if I don't have an even number of zeros. What if I have something like this, 500,000? That has five zeros after it instead of four, okay? So this, this, is, this, this is five times 100,000, right? Which is not a perfect square. But in this case here, what you can actually do, if you, if you don't have an even number of zeros, you can actually factor a 10 out of that. So this is the same as 5 times 10 times 1,000. Because 10 times 1,000 is, I'm sorry, 10 times, times 10,000. Because 10 times 10,000 is 100,000. All right? So now I do have a perfect square. I have a one followed by four zeros. So I'm gonna rewrite that as the square root of 10,000 times the square root of five times 10, which is just gonna be 50, right? And, I wanna, and when I take the square root of 10,000, what do I get? I punch that in my calculator and I get 100. So this is equal to 100 times the square root of 50. Does that make sense? Am I done simplifying? I'm not. There's a perfect square in this 50, right? 50 is the same as 100 times the square root of 25 times 2. And so when I pull the 5 out of that, I get this is 100 times 5 square root of 2. 100 times 5 equals 500 square root of 2. Okay, so it actually finally simplifies all the way down to that. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, any questions about any of that or anything that we covered today?
So we got through four chapters, but the good news is, really this last chapter was just a rehash, and it's just putting together what we learned in, in two of the previous lessons, all right? So it's really kind of the same stuff, just gives you an opportunity to practice that again. All right, so next week we will have a quiz in class, all right? So we'll have a quiz over, um, I don't know, I'll look at it. I'll, you'll see it in the assignment, how far the quiz is going to go. Um, but we, we, I want to go ahead and take a, another test. So we'll probably do a quiz next week. And, um, and I'll probably send a test home with you guys as well. That's over all the material that we've covered. Maybe, I think our last test went through 55. So, um, yeah, I guess we want to go through 65 on this one. So I probably won't include this chapter here. But um, we'll go all the way through 65. So we'll, we'll take a quiz in class next week. That'll give you an opportunity to take a quiz over the material that's going to be on the test. Right? And uh, and then I'll hand, hand out the test for you guys to take home with you. All right? All right, you guys have a good day.